Roy Jones Jr. was more than just a boxer. For 15 years, not only was he unbeaten, he was virtually untouched. He was given no choice but to box by a father who once fought the Viet Cong and Marvin Hagler. Roy Sr. put his son in the ring with bigger, older kids as soon as he could. The borderline abused young man grew up gifted. His body formed by and for nothing other than the sweet science. Roy's outrageous athletic gifts all operated under a mind that grew up in the ring seeing every stance and style the squared circle had to offer. After a disgraceful robbery at the 88 Olympics, Roy Jones turns pro with a chip on his shoulder. As always, click that like button and subscribe to stay up to the minute on all sweet science. Roy took on 16-1-1 Ron Amundsen in his third pro fight. Amundsen had an extensive amateur background with four Golden Gloves titles. Against the textbook fighter, the hows and whys of Roy's unusual style come through clear. He rarely used a jab to lead, instead choosing to lead with a snappy straight right. This punch comes over the top of an opponent's jab. When pressed, Roy would slide back before whipping in a left hook. His stance is a case study in high-risk, high-reward choices. But in round seven, Roy put him on the floor with a beautiful pair of left hooks. Before stuffing his third victim, face first into a wood chipper of uppercuts. Roy was on a killing spree. He hit the pro ranks like a bullet in the back, stopping every opponent with speed that left shocked faces and ringing eardrums. But his finest sniper's performance came against Art Serrano. Roy felt it from the opening bell. It took just a minute and a half to line up his crosshairs. Roy took a breath and pulled the trigger, caught it on the temple. Nobody was more surprised than Art. And I'm, I'm promised the world that one day I'm going to be a world champion. I'll be one of the greatest champions to ever live because I got the power. Roy would sift his way through the durable counterpuncher to Lonnie Malinga. Roy lived by the old adage of another all-time great. Kill the body and the head will die. Roy's speed overwhelmed his opponent, usually going high before digging heavy shots down to the body. Before long, Malinga's hand started sinking, but for the KO, Roy countered the counterpuncher, slipping Malinga's right hand as he landed a left hook, the right uppercut after it shuts off the lights. Malinga came to this fight only hoping to survive, couldn't even manage that. Vinny Paz was a pressure fighter from Providence. He was a showboating, swaggering swarmer whose flashy hand speed could rival even Roy's. Whatever I have to do to beat him, you know, I know he's a good kind of puncher. I'll be moving, I'll be, I'll be pressing the fight, I'll be around him, I'll be through him, and then I'm going to tear him apart. I feel great. Problem was, Vinny Paz was four inches shorter with four inches less reach. So when he needed it most, Roy's often absent jab was brilliant, along with virtually every other aspect of his performance that night. He landed 56% of his punches. And in round four, Vinny Paz landed nothing. 
Not a single punch. As Roy pot shot it and picked off the swarmer with ease. All right, uh, you all right? Okay, we're just, just kind of back. Back, 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 you know? Yeah, no. By round six, Pats was a mess. Bloodied and battered, Jones knocked him down three times. The final combination used the left hook to open up a pair of uppercuts that cut Paz down. He's a good fighter. You know, I came in here, gave him all, you know, I just couldn't get it going tonight. He, he, keep me, he kept me from, from uh, getting in my rhythm and getting it going on, you know? Thornton was a consummate professional, veteran of over 40 fights with an educated defense, a workmanlike offense. Roy shut his offense down completely and pot shot it where he could. With Thornton totally on defense in round three, Roy feints a body jab, Thornton reaches for it. Roy goes around his opponent's defense with a left hook to lay him flat at the end of the round. Round number three. Roy knew Tony wasn't throwing back, so in round four, Roy decided to bury Tony in boxing gloves. Roy took his first official loss via DQ for hitting Montel Griffin after he took a knee in a close fight. His 34-fight win streak was snapped by a single lapse of judgment. That ends your the feeling that you had that you were an unbeatable great fighter. No, it doesn't because I haven't been beat. I got disqualified. Roy demanded his rematch. It took Roy one round, one shot. Roy got his revenge with one of the most outlandish, instinctive punches in the history of the sport. A punch so lethal, you swear you could find the shell casing for it rolling in the ring somewhere. They gave it by the impulse of coach. No! Well, Jones still number one and gonna be that way, baby. Big for all these doubters. Him and all that kind of thing. Well, Jones is a fluke. Now they know. Roy kept going up and weight, kept looking ever more sensational as he did. Roy finally achieved his final form, facing a much bigger man. Richard Hall was four inches taller, had four inches more reach. But when the bell rang, Roy Jones fought like no other human being is capable. If you saw Roy in costume, doing this to random street criminals, you'd swear you just saw a superhero. He belonged in a comic book rather than a boxing ring. Roy moved like he should have been fighting the Green Goblin. What chance did the lanky Jamaican have? But for 11 rounds, Richard Hall absorbed a horrifying beating as Roy was content to play with his food. Roy flurried until finally the ref had seen enough. Roy carried on, still carries on. With his unorthodox brand of speed and power into his early 50s. You'll need every bit of it against fellow legend Mike Tyson coming up at the end of this year. As always, click that like button and subscribe to stay up to the minute on all sweet science.